Okay, I guess while Ben does that so that I don't take up much of his time, um, we usually have a tradition of like starting the ORI semester, uh, the ORI seminar each semester with a local speaker just to see like what's like the most exciting thing going around around Cornell. And um, in that sense, Ben is perhaps a perfect choice. So uh, it's a somewhat odd year in that we've been waiting excitedly for a year for Ben to actually come here from his postdoc at MSR, but now that he's here, None of us have actually met up, but a little bit of background. So Ben did his PhD at the Robotics Institute at CMU. Um, he actually joined CIS last year, but then he spent a, a year at MSR doing a postdoc. Um, and in terms of his research, he works on what I think he himself has termed the, the cherry of machine learning, uh, which is reinforcement learning. And in some sense is perhaps one of the experts in modern reinforcement learning to get a sense of how exciting his work is. Uh, if you go to his website, uh, many of you would know the NeurIPS paper accepts came out last Friday. And uh, the people all over the internet sort of really excited that they've got like one or two papers into NeurIPS. Um, ben, from what I could see, has five. Um, you can perhaps correct me if that's right or wrong, which is pretty amazing. And And so we are really excited and even though we have a little less time. I'm hoping he tells out about all of them. So over to Ben. Thanks, Sid. Um, okay, yeah, so um, just today I'm going to talk about policy gradient methods. So um, so this uh, in this talk, we're going to uh, look into how we can do exploration in policy gradient. And uh, also, you know, one of the potential benefits of policy gradient is the robustness. So we're gonna see you know, how we can achieve robustness compared to other family of methods such as Q-learning or bellman backup based algorithm. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, some of my former MSR colleagues, uh, Alec Agwar, uh, Mike Bohinev, who is now a postdoc at Facebook Bear, and Sean Kakali, who is a professor at UW. Okay, so in this talk, we, we're mainly gonna focus on policy optimization, especially we're gonna look into methods that does, you know, small incremental update on the policies. Um, so if you look into those uh, practical applications that people are studying in the literature, uh, policy gradient methods, especially policy incremental policy updated methods, they are the most, you know, popular methods people use in practice, right? So we use incremental policy update approach to solve this board game goal, and then OpenAI start using policy optimization based approach like PPO to uh, solve this pretty challenging uh, video game Dota. And later on, you know, they start using PPO, the policy optimization methods to uh, train this physical robotics, manipulate robotics arm to play this, uh, uh, this cubic, right? They can actually do Ruby script using this physical uh, um, robotic hand. So in this talk, um, this is the main question that we, we try to answer. Now, can we design a provably correct policy gradient algorithm? And uh, at the same time, potentially also maintain, you know, those practical advantages that we can get from policy gradient methods. Okay, so to, to study this problem, so we're really gonna look into this infinite horizon discounted MDPs. Uh, so in this model, we have two components and a learning agent and uh, uh, an environment. Where, uh, uh, where the learner, the agent gets data. And uh, the learner, the agent mind, he has something called a uh, policy that maps from a state that describes the environment as input and outputs an action. And then the agent will send the action to the environment. And then the environment will basically evolve according to the underlying Markovian transition. And the feedback that the agent gets from this one particular interaction is a one-step immediate reward and the next state that is generated from this uh, Markovian transition. And the goal of the agent is pretty simple. It wants to find a policy pi that maximizes the expected total discounted reward. Okay, so here the expectation is with respect to the randomness of the policy and also the underlying transition dynamics. So in this talk, um, so we're going to focus on very specific setting. Um, so we're going to say that we have an initial state distribution, mu zero, and, um, 
and we particularly are going to look at the setting where this mu zero is a delta distribution. Okay, so we have a fixed initial state as zero, and delta z mu zero assigns probability one to this fixed state and zero everywhere. Okay, so we basically have a fixed initial state as zero. Okay, so we're always going to start from a fixed state. You know, this fixed initial state might be really far away from the, the goal state, for instance, that forces you to do some sort of strategic or smart exploration in order to get to the goal. Okay. Um, so just a, like a one minute introduction of policy gradient methods. Um, so this algorithm is actually pretty easy. So if you do policy gradient methods, you usually start by first to parameterize your policy. Okay, so in this case, you know, you parameterize our policy as a neural network, for instance. And here, this parameterization theta really represents, you know, the weights in this neural network. Okay. Now we have this objective function, right? We have this objective function for each policy, which is the expected total reward. So in this case, um, if I have a parameterization theta that determines a policy, right? So then I have a well-defined objective function for my parameter theta. And then I can just use my favorite, you know, um, back propagation tools or whatever to compute the gradient with respect to theta of this objective function. Right? And once I get this gradient, I can just do gradient ascent. So here we're doing gradient ascent because we're defining things in terms of reward. So we want to maximize this objective function. Right? And you can also do a little bit, uh, you know, more advanced stuff here. For instance, you can define this Fisher information matrix and you're computing this precondition uh, uh, direction, and then you follow that precondition direction, right? So this is called a uh, natural policy gradient. And the natural policy gradient is really sort of the cornerstone of many practical algorithms that people develop today, including those algorithms such as trust region policy optimization and uh, uh, proximal policy optimization as well. Okay, so, um, so there are a lot of advantages of policy gradient methods, but I think one of the um, really strong advantage is, is, the, um, is this strong agnostic guarantees. Okay, so, um, so in policy gradient, we always start with some you know, abstract policy class. For instance, this policy class represents you know, all the policies that can be modeled by two layer feed forward neural network, for instance, right? Well, I mean, we have this policy class, but it's, it's really unclear if the true ground truth optimal policy actually falls into this policy class, right? So maybe our policy class is not rich enough to capture the true policy, but it would be nice if we can actually, you know, compete against the best policy inside this policy class, right? It doesn't have to be the optimal one, but you know, it would be nice if we have an algorithm that can find the policy that, it, that, is, competed, that is as good as the best policy in that policy class. So indeed, you can achieve this kind of guarantee in policy gradient methods, but under a sort of a, a bit strong assumption, right? So it says that if you have a wide reset distribution, so basically if this condition holds, so here um, d pi is the state distribution of a policy. So imagine you run a particular policy in the Markov decision process for many, many times, and you get a state distribution over state space. Okay. And this mu zero is, remember, this is the initial state distribution. Okay, so now imagine you have a very wide initial state distribution. In the support of the initial state distribution happen to cover the support of the best policies state distribution, right? So in this case, you can guarantee the policy gradient method will find a policy that is as good as pi tilde. Okay, but you know, if you look at another family of algorithms, such as Q-learning, fitted q iteration, they really cannot get this type of agnostic result, right? So they require something much stronger, something like, you know, the real Q star falls into, you know, your function class. And you also require something called Bellman completeness. So basically, um, the nice thing of policy gradient methods is that, you know, we always just taking the gradient of the objective function we care about, right? We are always, you know, stepping that direction in the, in the, in the correct direction. But if you look at those Q-learning, fitted Q-iteration algorithm, 
you know, when this realizability assumption, the element completeness assumption does not hold, and we really don't know what objective function, you know, these methods are really optimizing. So this is kind of different from, you know, policy gradient methods. So one of the successful story of policy gradient is that uh, this robot hand manipulation. So they were able to train this robot to manipulate this Rubik's cube. And I think one of the notable strategy that they used is this thing called um, domain randomization. So what they do in the training time is that they are gonna create many, many simulators by you know, randomly sampling different physical parameters, like the frictions, the weight of the object, and so on and so forth. So you create many, many simulators. And sometimes you also you know, add physical perturbation, for instance, just uh, using this stuff, the animal, you know, to perturb this object a little bit during training. So the, basically they're trying to make this mu zero, this initial distribution as wide as possible, right? So basically you add, you either physically add perturbation or you create many, many different simulators so that you can simulate the policy optimization procedure starting from, you know, a wide diverse configuration, right? So you don't have to start from, you know, a fixed initial state. So basically these domain randomization strategies is kind of making this mu zero as wide as possible. But policy gradient methods will actually fail if this initial condition does not hold, right? So let's look at this very simple example. So we have this Markov decision process, which is a long chain in this example. So the agent always starts from here, okay? And the agent only get rewarded at the other end of the chain, okay? So you have zero reward here along the chain and you have zero reward here all the way. Now you have three actions, two out of them will transit the agent back to S0, right? And the rest action will move the agent, you know, one step right, okay? So now you imagine that you start from S0, how are you gonna hit the reward, right? So you're gonna hit the reward if you just keep, you know, picking the correct action. Once you pick a wrong action, you're gonna be transited back to the initial state again, right? So now imagine for a learning algorithm, you know, I have no idea about this environment, right? So for a learning algorithm, a policy gradient algorithm, what I would do is just initialize some policy that sort of does random work. You know, a policy that picks uniform random actions among these three actions, right? Without any prior knowledge, this is a very reasonable initialization that I would do. But for such kind of random policy, we can literally compute what's the probability of such kind of random work hitting the goal, right? Which is like one to the three, one over three to the H, where H is the length of this, this horizon. And this really means that if you look at the gradient, right, the magnitude of the gradient will be exponentially small with respect to the horizon of this chain, right? And this actually applies to not only the first order gradient, but also the second and third and high order up to H to the log H order. Okay, so I'm not even talking about, you know, stochastic gradient here. I'm just talking about gradient, the exact gradient, the magnitude of the exact gradient of this initialization will be exponentially small. And uh, um, that really makes, that really basically saying that, you know, if you start from this particular initialization, if you do gradient descent, you know, do exact gradient descent, right? It's gonna take you exponential time. And this situation is really different from, you know, the optimization landscape problem that we were studying in supervised learning, for instance, right? So in supervised learning, um, you know, we know gradient descent tends to just work well, and we have quite a, a few um, good but simple initialization techniques, um, you know, to make this gradient descent uh, not so sensitive to the initialization. And in supervised learning, we often see these settle point pictures, right? So in the settle point pictures, we can, uh, you know, first order method will stuck, but you know, if you just uh, use the second order information, we will find a descent direction here. But this is not the case, you know, in this, this reinforcement learning problem, especially the problem, the toy problem that we saw in the previous slides, right? Here, we truly have an extremely flattened region at the initialization, at a, at a well-defined and well, a reasonable initialization, right? So you, you, for the agent, if she's around that, if she's at that initialization, she just look around, basically she will not be able to find any descent direction, no matter, you know, how many, how, no matter, what order of uh, information she used. Right? 
So this is really due to the lack of exploration. So as we can see from the previous slide, in order to get some useful feedback, some signal, we really need to be super careful in order, in terms of picking action. Right? We really need to hit the correct action at every time step in order to get to the end of the chain. And once we get some reward, then we get useful information, right? Otherwise we just get zero everywhere over and over again. And uh, we can further, you know, look into this uh, simple but uh, pretty hard problem indeed. So we call this problem bidirectional combination lock. So again, uh, I'm going to start from this initial state S0, okay? And I have two chains. You know, the agent will go either go to the first chain or go to the second chain by the condition on what action the agent took. And both chains are pretty long. And at the end of the chain, I will get some reward. Okay, so if I hit these two state, then I will get reward of five. And if I hit the uh, orange states in the second chain, I will get rewarded too. Um, and along the chain, I will get, uh, I will define two states, two types of states. So these white states, we call it survived state. So basically if you're at white state, then you're gonna have 10 actions to pick from. And nine out of these 10 actions will transit the agent to this black state which we will define in a moment and we call it that state, okay? And only one of the 10 actions will move the agent from the current white state to a white state in the next time step, okay? And once you hit this bad state, you will never be recovered, never be able to recover back. So if you, at the black state, whatever action you take, you will just be transited to the next black state. Okay, remember, you know, if you hit the black state and if you, you're gonna keep staying this black state until the end of the chain and you get reward zero at the end of the chain, right? And we're gonna make the problem even harder. Let's say we're just gonna give a little, a tiny reward for this dead state, okay? I'm not giving you that many. I'm just gonna give you one over capital H, you know, tiny reward. So that for a myopic agent, she might think, you know, going to the black state is a good strategy because I get zero reward in the white state, but once I transit to the black state, I get tiny reward, right? So this is a, a, very, a very valid local minima. So why this problem is hard, right? So first of all, we have this local minima. You know, the agent could always just transit to the black state and get, you know, tiny reward along the way. But this kind of myopic agent will miss the, you know, the the real gold, right, at the end of the both chain. And another issue in this, this is more like a practical issue. So another issue here is that a policy gradient agent tends to forget exploring both chains. Uh, so we will get that, uh, we'll get to this point in a minute. So let's look at, um, oh, here again. So if you just do a random strategy, right, uh, the chance of you hitting the, the, the gold at the end of the chain is roughly like, you know, 0 0.1 to the horizon of the chain, right? So if you do random strategy, you're gonna, you know, get back to this extreme, you know, flattened gradient sort of problem that we saw before. Okay, so let's look at, you know, how these, uh, some of the practical algorithms that people are using in the reinforcement in the literature uh, doing this problem. So uh, PPO is basically natural policy gradient. Right. It uses a uh, sort of proximal update to ensure, you know, my new policy is not that far away from the older policy in terms of, uh, you know, the KO divergence between two successive policies distribution. This is a, a very popular policy gradient method. So as we can see here, right, when our lens chain, the lens of the chain is two, then PPO can succeed in terms of, you know, successfully exploring both chains. But when I increase the horizon of the chain to five, you know, PPO start just, PPO basically doesn't do anything, right? As we said, you know, if you start from random initialization, what's the chance of hitting, you know, a valid uh, a, a gold state at the end, right? Which is exponentially small. You know, PPO quickly finds the local minimum, basically quickly transit to the uh, black state, and then just gonna stay there because this is really good local minimum. And there's another approach called PPO plus R&D, 
just stands for random network distillation. So I'm not going to go into the details of this approach, but this is sort of the state of art empirical uh, exploration approach people use to solve those, for instance, ch uh, challenging video games in Atari, for instance. Um, so what do you do is you add a little bit of reward bonus on those uh, less visited states so far so that you encourage the agent to visit those states. Right. So here we can see that uh, PPR plus R&D, um, half of the time it actually succeeds. So here succeed basically means you visit the better chain. So remember we have two chains and one of the chains better, one of the chains worse, right? So here PPO has 50% chance visiting a good chain and the rest of 50% chance it will forget to visit the better chain. So this is exactly you know, the forgetting issue that we were talking about. So if you further look into the traces of the policies outputted from this PPO plus R&D, um, we can see that indeed it forgets to explore both chains. So in this particular example, um, starting from say episode 500, um, so this agent is actually sort of exploring the first chain. Here I'm just plotting the traces of the agent of the policy at a particular episode on both chains. And gradually, as you can see in this example, when I hit episode 3500, uh, somehow PPO is exploring both chains. So it has traces on both chains, on chain one and on chain two. And at episode 5,000, it decides to just focus on exploring the second chain. And we can keep going. And around episode 6,000, it kind of figured out how to solve the second chain correctly, right? It avoids, it avoids visiting those bad states and put a lot of probability mass on those good states and until it hits the end. And then PPO can keep refining this procedure over and over again until the end of the episode 8,000 is successfully solved the second chain. It never visits those bad states along the second chain and just straightforward hit the goal state in the second chain. But it has zero probability of visiting the first chain at this moment because the policy itself at this stage is super, super deterministic. It has no probability of visiting the second chain, the, the first chain anymore. And unfortunately in this example, the first chain is a better chain. So PPO basically forgets to explore you know, the first chain because the policy becomes too deterministic. Okay, so summary of the PG methods, um, it's common issues. So the first issue is of course, it lacks ability to explore, right? Uh, so this is, we can, we can see this from uh, you know, this simple chain problem that we, um, just looking into the pre just looking at the previous slides, and the second thing is is more practical uh, practical issue. It's catastrophic forgetting, even with reward bonus. You know those uh, heuristic reward bonus. So in this talk, uh, so we're going to introduce an algorithm which we call policy cover policy gradient, in short PCPG, um, that explicitly trying to avoid the two common issues in policy gradient methods. Uh, specifically, we're going to use policy example to avoid forgetting, and we're going to re use reward bonus as well to uh, encourage exploration. Okay, so uh, before we dive into the algorithm, so just uh, uh, some quick notation. Um, again, we do this infinite horizon discounted MDP, and I'm going to define this common terminology such as value function and Q function. So uh, value function is essentially saying that if I'm starting at this particular state S and that if I follow the policy pi all the way to the end, you know, what's the expected total reward that I would get from this process, okay? And similarly, this Q function says that if I start from this particular state S and if I first take action A and then I follow policy pi all the way to the end, you know, what's the expected total reward that I would get from this process? And then we're going to uh, introduce this thing called state action distribution for a policy. Um, so I guess here the details doesn't really matter, but you can think about this quantity as something like, you know, you run this policy in this Markov decision process for a long time until you mixed, right? So what's the, at this stage, at the mixed stage, what's the distribution? What's the state action distribution, right? Okay. So, PCPG is, is a uh, iterative algorithm. So let's see uh, what are we gonna do at episode N. So this is really at episode 
uh, n plus one, let's see. Okay, so I have all the previous learned policy, pi one, pi two, all the way to pi n. I'm not gonna throw them away. I'm just gonna, you know, put them uh, in my RAM, for instance. Uh, what I'm gonna do is for each policy, I'm going to look at its state action distribution. Okay, and then I'm going to define the average state action distribution, which is a straight average of, you know, each policy's state action distribution, each policy in my policy cover. Okay, so, um, so here we really, so in the algorithm, we really don't need to compute this distribution because, you know, computing this distribution is hard, especially, you know, we are in large scale MDP. We just need the ability to sample from this distribution. But for now, uh, for simplicity, let's just assume we have this distribution for now, okay? But again, we just need the ability to sample a state action pair from this distribution. We just need the ability to sample a state action pair from row n. Okay, so, so now I can actually design reward bonus using this state action distribution. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to give a large number to a state action pair that is underrepresented by the current policy cover. Basically, a state action pair whose probability uh, under this mixture distribution is small. Okay, and I'm going to give a state action pair that can be really covered by the current policy cover a small reward bonus. Okay, so here in this cartoon image, these red dots are representing basically the states that are sampled from the mixture of the previous policies. Okay, so around these corners, these are underrepresented states, action, state action pairs. So I'm giving them large rewards. And for states around these regions, they can be well covered by the column policy. So I'm just gonna give them tiny rewards. Okay, so the goal is here is really to encourage the agent to go to those darker region, right? Which are the region that cannot be covered by the column policy cover. I have a quick question here. Um, yes. So is this bonus reward, is this something that you hand to the algorithm or is it something intrinsic? Yes. It, it, yeah, so it's, it's, it's some, some uh, function that we're gonna design and we're gonna hand it to the algorithm. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna see some specific example of it in the next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna do policy optimization. Okay, but so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to randomly sample a policy from my policy cover. Okay, let's see, I picked pi two randomly and I'm going to execute a pi two from the initial state at zero here. And I'm going to just execute this policy for a few time steps and stop at a random time step. Let's see, I stopped at it here. And once I get it here, now I'm just going to roll out my column policy, the policy that I'm going to optimize, right? To collect an unbiased estimate of its Q value, which is the expected total reward that I would get if I start from state S, taking action A, and then follow policy pi all the way to the end. Okay. And I'm just going to repeat this process a few times. So get I so that I get a mini batch data set that consists of state action pairs and its corresponding uh, reward to go, which is a sum of one step reward and reward bonus along the low out time steps. Okay, so once I get that, I can just do least square because I'm interested in get a function approximation of my Q value, right? So I have an unbiased estimate of my Q value so that I can just do this to square. I use a function approximator F to try to fit the quantity that I care about. And once I get that, I can just do this soft policy iteration, right? So I'm just gonna look at my critic and I'm just gonna do soft policy update. Uh, you know, this is my previous policy and I do soft policy update, I get a new policy. Okay, so I can repeat this process, this process inside this uh, dash green circle for multiple times until I'm confident that, you know, my new policy can actually collect good reward bonuses. And then I just gonna append this new policy to the policy cover and then I keep going uh, for a few more episodes. So, um, 
So let's let's just look at you know what what objective function that we are sort of optimizing at every episode. Okay. So inside this episode n, so what we really optimizing is actually this objective function. Okay. So here uh, the first important quantity is this mixture distribution. So remember we sort of average the state action distribution from every policy in my policy cover, right? So this is my policy covers state action distribution. So different from the original objective function, I'm not starting from, you know, this fixed mu zero, right? I'm actually starting from this state action distribution induced by my policy cover. And the second thing is that instead of just using the original reward, I have this reward bonus. So this really sort of avoids this sparse reward problem. And the policy cover avoids the uh, you know, forgetting issue. Okay, so- Can you uh, define the forgetting? Can you define the yes. forgetting again in this context? Like formally, what do you mean by forgetting? I guess forgetting is more like a practical issue. Um, so if, so I will show you, you know, the traces of this algorithm on that bidirectional, uh, bidirectional combination lock example again. So here, because you have policy cover, right? So you always have some probability, you know, constant probability of sampling a policy that is previously, you know, exploring a different chain. Because you always start optimization by loading from a policy that uniformly picked from the policy cover, right? You're never gonna load in from the initial state using your current policy. You're always gonna load in from a policy that is randomly picked from the policy cover and you're loading in for a few time steps and then you roll out, start doing optimization. So, so you can imagine something like, you know, I have a policy cover that, you know, defines a subspace of state action space that is, you know, well represented by the current policy cover. So all I'm doing is trying to start policy optimization around this like frontier of this subspace, right? I don't want to start from the initial state. I just want to, you know, collect the data around this frontier and then I can start, you know, hop out, right? To collect the reward bonus. So that's really sort of the goal of policy cover. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now let's see what would happen if you, if you use linear function approximation. So let's see, I have some feature vector of my state action pair phi, and I'm interested in using a linear function to approximate my Q value of a particular policy. Um, so instead of looking at this mixture state distribution, in linear case, we can just look at this covariance matrix, right? This uncentered covariance matrix, which uh, is the covariance matrix corresponds to this mixture state action distribution. And uh, now I, I can just, yes. I don't think you, uh, what you're writing is appearing on the screen. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So let me just stop sharing and uh, sharing again. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, so we're interested in linear function approximation. Okay. And uh, as I said, you know, we don't really need to compute this distribution. You know, computing distribution over infinite, you know, state action space is not possible, right? So we just need this covariance matrix. Uh, it's an uncentered covariance matrix of the distribution, this mixture distribution row n. And now we can just look at the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this covariance matrix, right? So what are we gonna do is for state action pair whose feature actually aligns with these small eigenvectors, I'm just gonna give them big reward bonus. Okay, so I look at the eigenvectors of my covariance matrix. For those eigenvectors that have big eigenvalues, these are the directions that are well explored by the current policy cover, right? So I don't have to give reward bonus to state action pair whose feature falls into that good subspace. But for subspace that has small eigenvalue, these are underrepresented subspace by the current policy cover, right? So if my state action pair's feature falls into that subspace, I definitely want to give it a big reward bonus because I want my agent to explore to explore that underrepresented subspace. So this is exactly what this reward bonus is doing. And with this reward bonus, we can really just use this linear function approximation plus the reward bonus together to approximate uh, this Q function 
of a particular policy. And once I get, so the combination of these two, uh, sort of the, the critic that I care, right? And with that, I can just do soft policy iteration. And then I just close the loop. And we can even specialize it to, you know, tabular MDP where everything is discrete. We have discrete state, we have discrete action. So here, my feature phi will, nothing, will be nothing but just a one hot encoder vector, right? So my phi will be zero everywhere except one at some place where this one corresponds to this particular state action pair, right? And in this case, you can show that this covariance matrix is nothing but just a diag diagonal matrix and where uh, each element in the diagonal is exactly the probability of this state action pair being visited by my policy cover. And then if you look at the reward bonus, right? So this is, this reward bonus actually makes sense here because my reward bonus is inversely proportional to the probability of a state action pair being visited by the column policy cover, right? So if a state action pair has low probability of being visited by the column policies in my policy cover, then I should give it a bigger reward bonus. And otherwise I should not give it a bigger reward bonus. I ask a question here. Yeah, so why is it not sufficient just to use a bonus? Why is it important to use a cover? If, I, if my row is just the recitation measure, uh, the, the distribution from one policy, isn't it also yeah. give a high reward to unvisited states? Yes, so the, so, the, so the policy cover is really, uh, um, so okay, so I think that backs to, goes back to, so this equation. So I'm really starting from my policy optimization from this policy cover distribution, mm -hmm. right? So you can get into a case where this is a well explored state and your initial state is here, but your reward bonus is outside this region. So if you just run policy gradient, the policy gradient has no idea how to escape that region. Right, so what this distribution is saying that I'm always starting my policy optimization around this frontier of you know, the well-covered state. And then I can just hop out and collect in reward. So this is really helping policy gradient to collect reward bonus. I see, so, so the bonus only tells you which state to, to explore, but it doesn't tell you how to actually get to right. the, those right. states. So yes. you want to use the right. previous policy. Yes. Well, of course, you know, here, another way you can do is, is, is trying to learn a model, right? Because you know that this region is well covered. So you can just collect the data and learn a model here. And then once you have a model, then you know how to sort of plan a pass from S0 to some, you know, outside of this region. So that's another way, right? But without a model or without the cover, uh, you, you don't really know how to, you know, sort of starting from S0 and get to the frontier of this cover. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so for well-specified cases, such as this linear MDP, uh, where you can sort of think about the setting where this is, you have a reward function and transition, both of them living in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this is nice because in this case, my Q function, the thing that I care about, that I care about to approximate, is always linear with respect to my feature phi. Okay. And in this case, in well-specified case, well specified meaning that I'm using linear function to approximate something that is also linear, right? So there's no model misspecification. And in this case, we can show that PCPG final policy pi hat that is absolutely near optimal using number of samples polynomial with respect to uh, all these relevant parameters, one over epsilon, this is horizon, log of number of actions and the dimension of my feature vector. Okay, so here you can actually extend this to an RKHS where this D is infinite because your feature dimension is infinite, but you can replace this D by this information gain quantity, right? the information gain defined by the kernel. So this is really the first result that can extend to infinite dimension RKHS linear MDP. And so let's compare to, you know, vanilla policy gradient method, for instance, the popular nature of policy gradient. So we talked about, you know, policy gradient will succeed if you have a wide initial distribution. So in the linear case, um, we can really look at this condition number. So imagine that this is a sort of white 
state action distribution now. So my policy optimization is starting from mu zero. And I look at the covariance matrix induced by this mu zero. And I compute the condition number, which is the ratio of the maximum eigenvalue over the minimum eigenvalue. Okay, so let's assume that you know, this condition number is, is, is bounded. So in this case, if you just run vanilla natural policy gradient, you will get a new optimal policy as well. And you're gonna pay everything poly, and especially with respect to the condition number. Okay, so if you have a, a wide distribution, initial state distribution, such that the covariance matrix induced from this initial distribution has a small condition number, then you can just run natural policy gradient. You're good. But the issue is that you know, this condition number could be exponential, right? Remember, remember the random walk example we have? If you use this random walk policies distribution as the initial state action distribution, then this condition number will be basically, um, you know, one, uh, three to the edge in that particular long chain example, right? So then you really cannot get any um, sort of polynomial guarantee. So PCPG really eliminates this condition number by actively exploring and building a policy cover. So um, I, I think I, I think I think I'm happy to just stop here because uh, the second part is, uh, you know, slightly it's a sort of over orthogonal. Like, uh, I guess you wanted to show us traces of how this works. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's maybe just jump into the experiment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, same example. Okay, um, so of course, you know, I won't show you this result if, you know, PCPG does not put a one in these entries. Okay, but I think the interesting thing is, you know, um, like, let's look into how each policy in the policy cover is, is, is exploring this, this, uh, this problem, right? So here I choose some policies in the policy cover. So for instance, policy 31 in my policy cover is actually focusing on exploring the second chain. And policy 11 is focusing on the first chain and policy zero is you know, doing nothing, right? It, it sort of explores both chains, but it put too much weight, uh, weight on those bad states, right? So if I'm mixing all of them together, then I really get a distribution that is quite a uniform at every state action pair in this environment. And I know that if I start doing policy gradient using this uniform distribution, starting from this uniform distribution, then I will guarantee to succeed in this example. And remember, this is a tabular example. So if I have a uniform distribution over every state action pair, and I, if I start policy gradient from that uniform distribution, then I guarantee to succeed, right? So I will not have that exponential thing because I can, because in that long chain example, I have one here, and now I have good probability of just starting from here. So I take a random action, I will hit a reward. So I will not get this initial, you know, exponential small gradient um, thing that we saw if we just starting from here. So another interesting example is this reward-free exploration. So here I'm trying to navigate in the maze. Okay, so I start from here. Uh, you know, I don't have the goal for now. So all I wanted to do is to explore this maze, cover every part of the Maze as quick as possible. Okay, and you know, reward free is interesting because if I'm able to quickly, you know, discover every piece of this maze, then later if you just give me a goal or a reward, then I quickly can quickly optimize it. Right. So here I have reward zero everywhere, and my phi is basically the final layer of some convolution neural network a random convolution neural network. So we are trying to use a random neural network to approximate some kernel, okay? So the policy here is, uh, takes also a convolution neural network because this image is the state that we feed into the policy, okay? So the policy takes this image, apply a bunch of cons and output an action. So action is up, right, down and left. Okay, so here are some traces from the policies in the policy cover. So uh, policy one is sort of just cannot really go that far because policy one is sort of a random policy, right? But policy four is managed you know, to quickly extend and explore further. 
and policy five ex explore even further. And policy 11 decides to explore a different region. And if you just mix them together, we are also gonna see a pretty uniform coverage over the entire maze. And if you compare against the other two methods, a uh, policy grading method, PPO, that we talk about, one of the most popular policy grading methods, and this empirical you know, policy grading methods plus bonus, we can see that PCPG can quickly cover uh, roughly like 70 to 80% of this maze compared, uh, and it's much faster compared to other two baselines. And another example we looked into is this continuous control for mountain car. And here, uh, you start from this valley and you hit the reward if you escape, okay? So otherwise you don't get any reward. And even worse, I'm gonna penalize the action. So if you take an action, you get a negative reward that is proportional to the magnitude of the action you apply to this car. Okay, so what is the local minimum? So the local minimum is just stay here, do nothing, right? Because once you do something, you're gonna be penalized by the magnitude of the control you put in the car. And again, you can show that uh, straightforward policy grading method, PPO, does not do anything, right? Because, because do nothing is a good local minimum. And PPO with R&D, it does something, sometimes solve the problem, but it has a huge variance here. And the average is not so good. And our approach actually can systematically solve this problem. And if you look at the traces, so here I'm just plotting the traces of the policies. Uh, so different color represent different uh, policy. So when I mix them together, you can sort of see, you know, this, this is, the policy, the mixture of the policies in policy cover is sort of trying to uniformly cover uh, the whole state space. So uh, that's basically it. Um, so we didn't get a chance to talk about this one, um, but you know, I'm happy to uh, talk about it uh, offline. Um, so we talked about PCPG achieves polynomial sample complexity in linear MDP, especially you know, in this RKHS linear MDP and of course, tabular MDP as well. And uh, empirically, we talk about how this policy cover can uh, you know, potentially avoid this forgetting issue that a lot of practical policy gradient methods will suffer. And finally, uh, we are still sort of playing around this algorithm by you know, integrating different um, you know, deep learning components and deep reinforcement learning components into this algorithm. And just using vanilla uh, implementation of PPO, and uh, the standard convolution neural network people use for Atari game, we can actually you know, quickly solve the pretty hard, notoriously hard Montezuma revenge problem in Atari game uh, reasonably fast. But we're sort of still exploring you know, this experiment result. And uh, uh, I really hope you know, we can get this, uh, you know, a more confident statistics in the near future on this game. I think uh, that's it. Yeah, thanks. I guess I'm clapping on behalf of everyone else, but okay. um, I, I mean, so maybe you can take some quick questions, but like I, I know, well, okay, when is around in Ithaca somewhere, um, but even though we can't meet in person, like I guess he is planning to sort of organize some sort of reading groups around thinking about some of these topics. So, but you should, everyone should definitely yeah. reach out to him if you're interested. Um, but any quick questions from, or slow questions. Yes, I do have a question here, Sid. Uh, so yeah. it's a, 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 well, it's a very nice eye-opening uh, talk. Uh, my question here to you in your experiment, uh, uh, are these uh, tasks uh, often it's a very long, basically discount factor is how, uh, in your experiment, this, uh, uh, is this, uh, this long episodes or is this actually relatively short? I mean, I guess uh, basically um, uh, uh, it's a question related to that or how large the state space is. Uh, so here, I mean, the state, for instance, in this example, the horizon is 1000 and uh, the state space is just continuous. Mm -hmm. It's two dimension, but it's continuous. And uh, in this example, uh, so I think we used the discount factor like uh, 0 0.99 and uh, 
uh, so here the state is just an image. So technically, you know, you have exponentially many images here. And, but you only have a small number of actions, which is upper, down, right, and left. Okay, good. On that note, um, anything, anything that uh, the, the, the action space is a, uh, I mean, that's assumption, right? So that that's solving any problem, even in the linearized case. That's where it may not be easy, right? L linear approximation. So the if the action right. space is large. Uh, yeah. So um, so in our case, uh, so let me just show you the. Uh, okay. So in experiments, we did small actions, um, but in the theory. Uh, what do we get here is indeed, um, okay, so here we get a log dependency and this is MPG and same here, we also get a log dependency. So our theory indeed, okay, so our theory does require discrete, na discrete nature of in the action space, but you know, your, your polynomial dependency only depends on log of the size of the action space. Good, thank you. So I guess you're not talking much about the proof, but like in a sense, what you were using as your um, the policy cover, this seemed like a it's sort of like a natural empirical dual in this case. So if I think of the discrete case and the constraints with the Q function, the the state action frequencies, the empirical state action frequencies would be the dual based on the data. Um, so is there a way of interpreting this as sort of choosing like some sort of a primal dual way of setting the policy? Primal dual. Um, Cause you're somehow combining the rewards from the policy plus the state action frequencies in order to like decide what to choose. Um, uh, okay, let me see. So, so, in this, so you're saying in this tabular case, uh, this is my reward and I'm combining this with the original reward. So I don't know if there's a oh. good like. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if there's a good like you know interpretation from a primal dual perspective. I actually don't know. Um, okay, fair. Um, other questions? So um, you uh, when you're it looks like you're. Um, you're you're having to trade off always this reward that you earn, plus the the exploration that you're looking at, and in the examples that you showed us, there was quite a lot of benefit to exploring very very broadly, um, and in some of the problems that at least I've thought about, there's a lot of concentration of that reward around some fairly narrow region. How would your um, uh, exploration policies work in such examples? Yes. Um, so if your problem does not really you know require sophisticated exploration. Then uh, I think uh, you know simple exploration strategy like absolute greedy might just work very well. Uh, I mean, this is something that you know we observe in, for instance, the contextual bandits as well. For contextual bandit problem where you don't require that sophisticated exploration, you know, absolute greedy always kind of just work well, and well, much better than you know sophisticated methods that we develop, for instance. Um, so I think in this case, if you look at um, Sort of the result, um, oh sorry, the result we get in the linear MDP case, you know, which subsumes the tabular MDP. So we eventually gonna hit this optimal pause, right? Absolute near optimal pause. But again, you know, because you're trying to do exploration, so you might waste a lot of samples doing exploration rather than just quickly dive into the exploitation phase and collecting rewards. But eventually, you know, you're gonna hit, you're gonna, you're gonna sort of hit the optimal policy. Um, yeah. So I think, I think for for tasks that does not require sophisticated exploration, um, so unfortunately, this exploration based strategy, at least from experiment perspective, I often observe, you know, they perform worse than, for instance, just the naive epsilon greedy type of exploration strategy in both RL and also in contextual bandits as well. Thank you. And then in, in some situations where you actually do want to explore, you are you're still, there is this trade-off. 
but I didn't quite see where that trade-off was showing up because your um, your bonus for the states is, is, is really purely defined by uh, that covariance, essentially how much are you covering? Yes. Uh, okay, so I think um, it's somewhere here. So, um, okay, sorry, uh, good question. I think uh, um, there is a, uh, my bad, there's a typo here. Okay, so here, I think this should be times n. Okay, so I'm, I should do this unnormalized, uncentered covariance matrix. Okay, so this is essentially see. C. Sum over i equal to one to n, expectation of SA over d pi i of, you know, phi phi transpose. So my n is increasing. Right, so that basically says that my reward bonus is, you know, is monotonic, is not monotonically, uh, well, it's monotonically decreasing. Yeah, so right? because I'm taking, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, thank you, that, that helps. And, yep. and, and also there's a, you know, regularization here as well to avoid, you know, uh, to make sure this guy, this, the inverse of this guy is, is, uh, exists. Thank you, yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks, thanks, yeah. So instead of sampling from your cover uniformly, does it make sense to sample non-uniformly so as to say maximize the diversity or minimize the condition so. number? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, this is actually something that we played around in the experiment, but in proof, we don't know how to do, you know, how to show the benefits of this. But in experiments, what we did here is that, let's see, you know, I have estimate for each policies, covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. So I can just do sum over i equal to one to n of alpha i times, you know, this d pi i of phi phi transpose. And let's optimize alpha i with respect to this objective function, mm -hmm. right? So I'm trying to find the best linear combination of this covariance matrix such that the resulting covariance matrix has a big determinant, has a big volume. So we did that in experiment and definitely helps. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, awesome. Um, if no more questions, let's thank Ben again. And uh, I guess watch out. I know he's starting a group around sort of looking at some of these problems. I know many of us are interested here in that. And it's really good to have you here sort of leading this. And, Looking forward to talking to you a lot. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you.